on this guy from Silicon Valley. We'll see. Uh, okay. Uh, Steve Hoffman. Great. Thank you. Thanks, Rob. So let's see if this is working. Right, let me try to angle this right. Can you hear me? Yes. Can you hear me in the back? Yes. Okay, great. So good to be here tonight. Thank you, Rob. Rob's a great guy. He's you got to get his sense of humor. He's really funny. <laughs> and um, I just want to say uh, thank you all for coming. And I'm going to try to keep you awake tonight. It's, we're going to cover a lot of stuff. I'll go quickly. But I want you to be able to ask questions. So if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me. At a certain point, if there are too many questions, I may not take any more questions just to get through it. But we'll do that. So the, the, the focus of this is how to, raise, uh, you know, how to launch your startup without a lot of money. That is critical for most startups. I mean, most people I know don't have a lot of money. You may, like, if you can put 50K into your startup at the beginning, that's pretty good. Uh, but a lot of people don't have millions of dollars. So I think this is key, and I'm going to give you all the tips that I see startups using that really work. Now, I run Founderspace. I've done three venture funded startups myself, so I've been through the whole thing. I did my first startup on no money, <laughs> actually, almost went bankrupt a couple times. So I, I know what it's like to be in your shoes. I know what it's like to be a founder. And founder space is an accelerator in the city. So we have earned a pretty good reputation. We take startups from all over the world, and the Bay Area included. And we're kind of on Inc. Magazine's top 10 list of accelerators. And Forbes gave us number one in the category of helping startups from overseas actually uh, plug into Silicon Valley. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> So, so we, we, we've done pretty good. Now let me start off with the first point. And this is really critical, the right idea. And I don't mean the right idea in terms of having a brilliant idea. We all want to have a brilliant idea. But I mean the right idea that you can do yourself without a lot of money. So I see a lot of startup founders, and they come to me, and they're like, if I only had a million dollars, or if I only had an investor who'd put in 100K, then I could change the world. And I go back to them and say, you know, and they're really focused on their idea. And it could be a big thing, right? Huge, but it's very capital intensive. And I was like, there are a lot of ideas you can execute on with no money that you can build from the ground up that can become viable businesses, either businesses that give you a lot of income or businesses that are venture fundable. And look, for, there's a lot of businesses out there that you actually don't need venture capital for, nor should you even waste your time trying to get it. They can, you know, you could be pocketing five, $10 million or $1 million a year. That's pretty darn good. So, and you can do that on the web. There are a lot of ideas out there. So don't restrict yourself, but understand what you're doing. And when you begin, if you're looking at your idea and you need $5 million to just get going, forget it. You know, that's a Series A round, and the bar has gone way up on Series A. So to get a Series A, you have to have significant traction. If you can't even get going and prove out your business model, without a lot of money, don't do it. Pick another idea. It's so, it costs you nothing to choose another idea. It costs you maybe a year of your life to struggle to raise money on something that you can't get funded on simply because you need a lot of money to prove it out, to validate the business. So uh, a lot of entrepreneurs think that because it's my idea, I love it. You know, I'm not going to give up. I, I started this idea, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to see it through. I, I would be a failure if I give up. Well. The smartest entrepreneurs out there actually test a lot of things really, really fast. And when one thing goes, they stick with it. When one fails, they just drop it. So they're like, whatever. They, you know, they don't attach their ego to the idea. So don't think that your idea reflects upon you as a person. It only reflects upon you as a person if you stick with it and it's not working. Because <laughs> as long as you do, you're going to be a, a failure. As soon as you switch and find something better, you will no longer be a failure. So. Um, this is really, really important for all of you to kind of grasp that concept. Because I made the mistake in my, uh, at the beginning when I was starting companies of sticking with ideas because I thought of them, and then because I didn't want to admit I was wrong. Right? <laughs> I didn't want to admit it didn't work. I wanted to like, prove it would work. But no matter how much work you do on an idea that doesn't quite work, it's still not going to work. Because <laughs> I found you can just put all your, you can like, be the most amazing person in the world who sticks on the wrong idea, and nothing will happen. Or you could be like a mediocre person who comes up with the right thing that can, you can do within your scope of your budget, and you can resource the talent and bring them onto your team, and it just goes. And so you know when an idea is going. 
I'll tell you when. When it is pulling you along, like when everything's just happening so fast that you, like you can't keep up to keep feeding it, feeding the beast. If you don't feel your, at, at a certain point, at the beginning it's always going to be a lot of work. But at a certain point, if it's not pulling you, instead of you just struggling to push that thing up the hill, you know, and having it just roll down again like Sisyphus, if it's, if it's not pulling you, then just drop it. Honestly, it doesn't matter if you put in 10 days to that or 10 years. Just drop it. Like, recognize, okay, I, I figured it out. This thing is too hard. <laughs> it's like not working. Um, so your whole goal right now is, is that is number one. If you can't do this, then you're just going to be stuck. Let's go. Challenge your beliefs. So uh, we all have beliefs, things that we believe are true, and, and especially about, about the world. Right? We, things are this way. This is how they are. The greatest startups challenge that. They say they don't have to be this way. What if they were this way? And then everything changes. Because you look at all the big breakthroughs, um, you know, whether it's Airbnb, right? You know, people will never rent out their apartments. You know, nobody wants strangers in their house. You know, that, could, that was like a common belief before Airbnb was around. Like, it would be weird, you know, to have somebody in my spare bedroom that I didn't even know, you know? <laughs> you ask people, like, you know, before Airbnb, and everybody would think, now they're like, everybody's like, oh, yeah, of course. Person in my spare bedroom, I make some money, yeah. Um, so, you know, it's not a problem at all. Everybody's doing it. Um, you don't feel creeped out if they're a serial killer? No, no, no. They're all, yeah, I can check their, <laughs> I can check them online. Airbnb says they're okay. They're not going to kill me. <laughs> so, um, but, the, but those are set beliefs, right? So every big disruptive business is out there is actually changing paradigms like that. So I remember, like, before YouTube came around, all of these startups had tried to put video online and failed. There was Den and all these other ones. I'm an old timer, so I go back. And I remember there were all these people before YouTube who just failed, 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 failed. And then YouTube worked. And, and there was a common belief, like after the dot-com crash, that, you know, video online is just not going to work. It's, you know, you know, you're not going to get a mass audience. It's too expensive. And, you know, all these people, all these reasons to say no. So, uh, Challenge them. So whenever you're out there and whenever you see everybody saying the same thing, uh, it doesn't mean it's true. But what you need to do is, is figure it out. And then there's another type of challenge in your beliefs that's, that, that's really important. So whenever you're in a business and things are done a certain way, just ask, why are they done that way? Do they have to be done that way or not? In your own company, like right now, what you're doing, you're doing things a certain way. You, like, you have a set of beliefs. You don't even know that you have them. Most of us never you know, analyze our own beliefs. We're just like, well, we believe them, so <laughs> why question? Unless somebody else confronts us on our beliefs, then we would like argue back. Um, but usually people are polite and nobody really confronts you too much, um, especially in California. You know, we're, <laughs> we're like, well, whatever. <laughs> you know, you want to be Hare Krishna? Great. You know, so, but no, but in your own beliefs with your own company, uh, analyze, write down everything you have assumed to be true with your company, everything that your business is predicated on, all the things, and challenge each one. Say, so what if that isn't true? What if, you know, I believe my customer wants X? Do they really want X? What if, is that really true? Is that what they really want? Go out and ask them, right? Or I believe that the market works this way. Or I believe that this is the right, right price point. How did you come to that price point? Some people just, you know, you pick a price, right? And then it seems to work so you don't think about it again. Well, no, challenge that. Try different prices. Every single thing about your business, uh, just list them out. So everything you can believe, and get other people to do this. Everybody on your team should be doing this. And then each one, uh, systematically challenge. You could find ways to actually, that's how you innovate, right? That's how you come up with new ideas. That's how you grow as a company. That's how you grow tech and all the other things. So, so do that. Challenge them. Uh, th this is the one thing. This is the reason, uh, the fundamental reason, that startups succeed where big corporations can't. This is like the root of innovating as a startup and succeeding. See, none of these things I'm talking about cost money. They're all just your brain, right? So big corporations, you know, they have all the resources in the world. They have distribution channels. They have the customers. They have everything. Why shouldn't they just be crushing startups? Because they have something to lose. Startup, like you're a startup founder, you're scrappy. You have nothing to lose. You don't, like, you don't care if you give away your product, right? So take Robinhood. Everybody know what Robinhood is? So it's a free online brokerage, right? You can get it. It's an app on your phone where you can buy and sell stocks. Pay no commission. 
So all the, first of all, brokers used to charge an astronomical amount of money. They would take like a percentage in the old days. Some of you don't even remember this. Like if you went to a stockbroker, you know, they'd charge you a percentage of the transaction and a fee on top of that. And the fee was usually at 50 or $100 plus a percentage of the transaction. And that, then the online brokers came, you know, like E-Trade and Schwab and all these guys, and they lowered the price down to like, you know, now you can get it like six, seven bucks, you know, but it kept dropping at first. It just went down, 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 down. And then they thought they were disruptors. Now Robinhood's out there giving it away for free. Why? Because they don't care if they ruin the business for everybody else. They don't have, uh, you know, billions of dollars at stake. They have nothing to lose by lowering the price. They're not going to get anywhere. So they're like, we'll attract customers and we'll figure out how to make money elsewhere. So most startups, most successful startups it, that are disruptors, do, do exactly this. They look at a market and they're, they're just like, they figure out some other way that they can monetize it and they just give, give it away, right? Or they cut the price way, way down. So, uh, you know, OnePlus, that, that phone that's out now, it's just like huge on TechCrunch and all these things. So it's this Chinese phone manufacturer. They sell their phones basically at cost almost. They're like, we don't care. Like, eat, take this Samsung, take this Apple. So they're coming out with a phone that's like as good as an you know, an iPhone 6 or a Samsung, and it, with all the latest hardware and everything, just over $300, half the price of the, you know, the, iPhone, the cheapest iPhone or the Samsung. And what are they doing? They don't care. They have nothing to lose. They're a startup, right? So they're like, we'll just, we're basically giving away these phones. Like, we're not making a profit on these phones because we're going to monetize it other ways, and we're going to take market share because we know if we get enough market share. The, I, the CEO said, you know, if I get enough market share, then, you know, I don't, He'll be a rich dude. <laughs> he doesn't care. He'll be like the next Xiaomi, you know? So, they're, um, so when you look to start a company, you know, with little or no money, especially look at what, you, think about your strengths. So every startup has strengths, and this is one of the biggest strengths. Because nothing to lose means you can be creative. You can do anything. You have no revenue streams to sacrifice. Now, smart companies like Amazon are always, uh, Amazon in particular has this mantra of disrupting themselves. So that's why Amazon just keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. Yeah, they never make money. <laughs> I mean, if you, Amazon stock seems to go like this, but their profits never are always a quarters out, you know? Because they are constantly disrupting themselves and they will not be undersold and they will always look for way, they try to think like a startup. So, but most companies cannot do that. I mean, they just, it's not in their DNA. Uh, they are all worried about the next quarter with the sh uh, shareholders. So Amazon is sort of, mesmerized uh, Wall Street to believe that they don't have to make money. But most of these companies actually are locked in businesses where if they don't hit their quarterly results, their stock is going to tank. And the CEO and all the top executives are motivated by stock options. So they're not about to have their stock options tank and maybe get removed by the board. So they, never, so they won't do this. So they won't disrupt themselves. So you, you guys, it's open field. You can keep disrupting. You can disrupt the disruptors once they get big enough, right? Like the online brokerage. So think about that. Right team. This, again, costs you no money unless you hire them. But these guys might, you know, Mr. T and stuff. Um, the, getting the right team is so important. So, so many startup founders I see make this mistake early on. They go out there with themselves because they're passionate and they're going to do it. They can't find the right other people to join. So they just start doing it themselves. They hire like a team in India or wherever, some other country, China, to actually build the software. Or they get a part-time consultant or somebody who's working to do it part-time, but they're not really committed. And then they end up spending a lot of time doing it. So maybe six, eight, 12 months later, they have their product. And then they go to try to raise money only to find investors like, where's your team? <laughs> And they're like, well, I, you know, I don't, don't need a team. Look, I did it. But investors, they invest in teams. Um, they are looking for, they, first of all, think about it. If you, one of the criteria of investors, if you're an investor out there, you want uh, a billion dollar company. Has a billion dollar company, are, it, seldom are billion dollar companies started by one person. They're almost always, even Larry Ellison at Oracle had a partner. All these guys had partners, you know? Uh, and, and there's a reason for that. They bring on partner, they bring good leaders, surround themselves with good, great talent. 
you, in order to be a great leader, you have to be able to attract people. You have to be able to work with people and inspire people. So what they want to see is not just that you have the right team members, like a technical co-founder. They want to see that you are able to actually convince really smart people who could be having great paying jobs uh, you know, at Google or Facebook or wherever to give up their careers and come work for you for free because they believe in this vision and because they believe in you, most importantly. Because if you can do that, if you can get great people onto your team, you're proving to investors that you're a great leader, right? That you can sell your vision. So that's why they always say we invest in teams. Um, the other reason that, that it's really important to have a team up front is that the team itself, uh, if you run out of money and you have the right team, you can keep going. If the team is committed and the team has the technical knowledge and know-how to push your product further, you can get over those dips that we all experience when we're, when we're trying to do those hard times, right? When there's no money and, and it seems like it'll never work, you can push through those. If you're by yourself, the chance of you giving up goes up exponentially. Trust me, like you all know, right? If you're by yourself and it's not working, if you're with your teammates and they're moving forward, you'll just keep going with them, right? But if by yourself, you're like, oh my God, and you just give up. So all those reasons can uh, add up to forming a great team. Now this doesn't, so don't do it a year or two later because you know what happens? Then you feel like you've put so much into this company, you put $50,000 hiring engineers, you put all your time and energy, and you want to give your co-founders uh, very uh, little equity. So you're like, well, look, I suffered for this. So I'm going to have 80% and you're going to have 5% and you're going to have 5% and you're going to have 5%, right? To the, the three co-founders you bring on later, you're not going to get great co-founders at 5%. They're not going to give up their jobs at Google or Facebook to join you, most likely, to join you for 5%, unless you're already funded and you can pay them a salary. But of course, you, you're in that catch-22. You don't have, you're getting them on so you can get funding, but you've already put a lot of work into it. So let's say you're in that unenvious spot of having done a ton of work yourself, and you don't want to give away that equity. That's all in your brain. Don't, don't think like that. Think about what you need to do su to succeed. Are you going to toil another year because you, or get the wrong team member on board because you don't want to sacrifice equity that you feel like you've earned? That equity means nothing. It is worth zero until you build a successful business. So all that equity, that 80% that you want to keep for yourself because you have suffered so much and put so much into this of your time and money, means zero. It's worth nothing if you don't get the right team and get going. Yes? What does it mean to be a better balance of what? equity? Well, I think, Can you repeat the question? What? oh, sorry. What is a better balance for equity distribution than the, the, the founder who put their own money in and time taking 80 or 90 percent and trying to get a team with the rest? <laughs> um, so I, oh, well, my, first of all, I say give everybody more equity than you believe they deserve, um, even if you spent money and time, because it doesn't matter. If you want to get that money back, that $50,000 back, you got to get great team members on board. Honestly, you have to. Um, so at the beginning, if it's at the very beginning, um, I see a lot of times it's equal split if you have all great, talented people. Sometimes the CEO takes a little more, the founder, but usually not exponentially more. At the most, you know, the founder may take up to twice as much, but if you get over 2x your other co-founders, it's getting ridiculous. It's, it's not a real start. They're not real co-founders. <laughs> so that's kind of a rule of thumb. But it, it varies on a case-by-case -case basis, of course. What my main point here is... Uh, go for the best team members you can possibly get and give them what you need to give them to get on your team and make it happen. That's what will get your money back. That's what will make whatever percentage you have worth something. Otherwise, you're hurting yourself. You're not actually gaining. You're actually, it's, it's reverse intuitive, right? By giving away more, you are actually, the chance of your stock being worth more is much higher. So just focus on the quality of the people. Like, is this, can this person move mountains? Are they a coder? That can move. What do I need to get this person on my team, right? If, they, if, they, if they're brilliant, what do I need to do to get them on? Not what have I done uh, in the past. Yes? How do you find and identify the right team members? Well, that is an art in itself. <laughs> so, yeah, so it's a whole, how do I find uh, and identify the right team member? So that is, is really uh, uh, not always easy. 
Um, I always, I'll tell you what I look for when I hire, and I don't have all the answers, but I look for people who, at a, who love what they do, who are passionate about what they do. So if they're an engineer, I want them building like, you know, in, the, in their garage building stuff. I want them coding just for fun. I want to see all these extra projects that they have worked on without any pay because they love it, right? They're going to be the best engineer. They're the ones who are going to stay up all night. The ones who are just coding for dollars, that person is not your person for a startup. That person is a great contractor or a great person for a job. Those aren't the people you want to bring on initially. You might hire them later and they'll do a decent job, but they're not going to, they're not going to innovate. They're not going to drive your company. They're not going to invent something new for you. If they're a marketing person, again, they, under, they know everything about marketing. I mean, they live and breathe what they do, right? So you look at people, and I'm always like weird, like if I go into a doctor's office and you're talking to a doctor and you're like, what about this? Because you always like look online because it's your disease. You're like, what am I like? And then you ask them about it and they don't know. That's like a red flag to me. Like, you know, these are like kind of basic things. If I could find it online, I think you should know about it, doctor. You know, you don't want a doctor who doesn't know. You don't want anybody in your company who really uh, doesn't, isn't like out there. If they don't know, they're going to come back to you tomorrow and tell you they figured it out because they were curious without you even asking, right? You're going to ask them a question. They're going to come back tomorrow and say, look, I did this, 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 and this. And that's what, that's what people are doing that's making them successful or, you know, whether it's marketing or PR or UI design. I mean, UI design is great because you can look at their portfolio. And if you have a sense for design, you can see if they've got talent. If you don't have a sense for design, you find somebody who does to help you critique them. But in every field, those are, especially in a startup, that's what, that's what you want more. And of course, I don't care that much about resumes if I can find other ways. A lot of times people are young right out of college and they're like gems, right? A lot of times people have years of experience and they're great. Sometimes they're not. So resumes are less important. Don't make the mistake of like when you get funding to staff it up with names from big companies to make yourself feel good. Go with the person. Always go with the person. So like, don't just go, oh, they went to Harvard and then they worked at Twitter. I'm hiring them, right? <laughs> I don't believe in that. It, what? Yeah. So, so that answers yeah. how to identify them, but how to find them. Ah, finding them. Finding them is like all things in life. Uh, <laughs> it's a lot of work. <laughs> it's a lot of work. It's not like if it was easy, well, especially here in the Valley, right? Finding talent. I mean, everybody's after that talent. So I always say go to the places where they, where the ones you want would hang out. So if you're looking for somebody who's kind of a hacker, you know, go to kind of those hacker labs and go to hackathons and places that people like that would be. Go to, like if you're looking for great engineers, you know, go to the HADAP seminar. You might not even know what HADAP means. It doesn't matter. Show up there with all these geeks. They all know what it means or they want to, they want to, and it, it should be the latest technology because if they're really up and really into it, you don't want the ones who are learning old technologies. They're just kind of learning. You want like the latest, greatest thing. So Swift or whatever it is, you know, these things are always coming out. Whatever the latest technology is, look it up, like the hot technology on Slashdot or what everybody's talking about. Go to those groups, those meetup groups, and just sit there. You won't understand a thing, but your job is to socialize with everybody. Hey, how's it going? You know, don't try to sell your startup. Just make friends with them and, and be interested in what they're doing. And, and, oh, I'm a startup founder. I was curious about this thing, a hat up, whatever it is. You know, um, and then you meet them and you get them. I guarantee like at an event like this, you go to these type of events, you're just going to meet other entrepreneurs. They're not going to be joining your company. But you go to events out of the way, marketing events, go to like the hardcore marketing things, like the things like where, you know, all the real geek marketers go. Uh, wherever it is that that type of person hangs out, you should go to. If it's a UI thing, find out all the like the geeky UI stuff where they're you know doing it, and go to those to get that person. Yes. What was the name of that seminar? Hadup. I just made that up. Hadup is a tech. Hadup is a technology. It's a technology. It's not a seminar. So uh, it's just like PHP or you know C plus plus or it's uh, or any of these things. MySQL. So I'm just saying, go to look at the latest tech trends and figure out what the meetup groups are on those and go to those. That, that was my. Uh, define your business goals. So, so many people don't really uh, spend enough time doing this up front. You need to know what direction you're going. You need to know what your goals are. I, can, I can't make that more clear. See, sometimes people just have this brilliant idea of what they'll do, but they haven't really thought through the business. So, this is really important. You need to list out every, all your key goals. And I'll, I'll keep it short because we're taking more time. 
Go to the core. Now, I always like, when, when you start a business with no money, it means that you fundamentally don't have a lot of resources. You might have one engineer, hopefully, that you got at the beginning who's committed, or you're going to go out and get tomorrow. One like designer. I like teams like there's an engineer, there's a designer, and there's somebody who knows the business inside and out, who spends all their time with the customer, right? Understands the user, whoever they're, whoever they're trying to engage. Then the next thing to do is figure out what is the simplest thing you can offer that person. The simplest, the, like the core value. People don't, no matter how big the company is, no matter how many features the product has, people use things for one reason. We all know that. One primary reason. And then there's a bunch of other reasons they use it. But especially with new companies, they get the new thing for it does one thing so, so well. And that thing is fundamentally different from anything else out there. So if your core is already a feature of some other product out there, forget it, right? Don't say, I never want to hear you say, I have this, 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 and this feature, right? That's like, OK, you don't, you're never going to succeed. <laughs> <laughs> you know, nobody goes to a service, a product or service for this, 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 a new one for this feature. They go for that one feature they can't get anywhere else that's done either so brilliantly or differently than everybody that it, it just, they have to have it. They have to love it. They have to use it. So if you can isolate your, if you can't isolate your core of what your business does, don't go further. There's a problem, a big, big problem. So you need to ask yourself, what is my core? And it better be and then look at all the competitors out there and see if they have it already. And if they have it already, and you have to, it, it, you have to do that in such a perfect way. You have to have such a deep understanding of what your customer wants that the way you do it makes it's not like any of the others. It could be the same type of service, right? Like an ad service or whatever. It doesn't have to be like totally new thing that you invented on Mars. It's something out there that already exists. But you have figured out a way to give it to your customer that provides a unique value to them, and, and a value that's, that's so important to them that they would, not, they would drop other things or use it in addition to other things. And that's what you need to prove out. That's, yes? Don't, well, well it depends, right? Um, there are only two business models out there, two. That, uh, so it's real, monetization is like one of the easiest questions in the world, or should be for all of you. Because there are only two. One, advertising. Two, people pay for it. Like that, I mean, if you look at every business model out there, with, it's advertising or people pay money for it directly. So advertising is somebody else's paying <laughs> for you to use the product. So, but for advertising to work, you need a huge number of users. So your whole, what you're building has to appeal to a huge number of users, and they have to engage frequently, um, and they have to engage deeply. So they have to be frequent users where they're always returning to it and use it for a long time. Otherwise, you can't serve up enough ads to make it. Think, why is WhatsApp so, so, was so valuable, 19 billion to Facebook? People use it every day, many, 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 many times, right, when you're on what, any of these messaging apps. That's why it's a big, that's why it's a cash, well, that's what Facebook is. People use it many, many, many times daily, right? That, and appeals to millions and millions of people. That's the ad model. So if, you, if your thing doesn't meet that, those fundamental, if it's a small audience, a niche audience, you're never going to add, the ad model doesn't work, right? Um, so you need, so you really need to think that through. If it fits that model, it does. Then if it doesn't fit that model, you only have one other choice. Somebody's got to pay for it. <laughs> and so it can be a SaaS model, which is basically just subscription. It can be like in-app purchases. It can, you know, it, they can buy it outright, you know, just buy the product. The, uh, so it's really one of those others. But and when they pay for it, I'll tell you what investors want. If you're going to have a big business, they want to see recurring revenue. That's why they like revenue that you can, mon basically you can monetize your customer deeply. Because if you sell it once for 99 cents and there's no reason for them to come back, very hard to make more than a million bucks or a couple, few million bucks. If you're really lucky, they've all bought it for 99 cents and they're off to you know, the next, somebody else's product, right? So they want it where you're charging them over and over and over. Or the whole in-app purchase thing where they can, you, these consumables that you keep selling them. So a few, a, a small minority will just, you can monetize super deeply. You can get thousands and thousands of dollars out of those. That's the whole game model. Um, 
And then there's SaaS where you just have a subscription, right? And that's been around forever. Magazines, newspapers, you know, you name it. None of these are really that new. Like when business models, these models have been around forever. <laughs> it's, we're just applying them to, to new things. So the business models have never really changed. It's not 